Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. All right, yeah. Glad to see everyone so bright-eyed and bushy-tailed this early in the morning. Uh, so I'm here to talk to you guys about uh, finding the bad guys once they're already on your networks. Uh, so who here knows what they can detect on their network? Okay. Well, that's, that's scary. Uh, who here knows what you can't detect on your network? Okay. All right, that's good. <laughs> um, so my name's Mike. I'm uh, from the MITRE Corporation. We do research and development for the federal government um, in the cybersecurity tech center there. Um, so the cyber attack life cycle, who's, who's familiar with that? Show of hands. The, the kill chain is uh, a corollary to this. So what we've done is uh, we've done a project that focuses on finding the adversary post-exploit, so once they're on your network. The most recent Mandiant or uh, FireIM Trends report showed that an adversary is on your network an average of 146 days before they're detected. Now, if you uh, think about previous years, that's an improvement, but they broke down the statistics a little bit this year from whether it's detected internally or externally. If you find it inside your network, you yourselves find it, you're looking at about 56 days on average that the adversary's there if they're detected. But if you're notified from the outside, let's say your ISP or somebody from the outside world says, hey, there's something weird going on on your network, it's about 320 days. So just think about how long it takes for one of your IT guys to get onboarded, learn your network, and start to get to work. Um, that's essentially the same kind of onboarding that an adversary would have. So what we've done is we've done a lot of research, both with our government sponsors and by reading industry reports and working with industry, to come up with an adversary behavior model. And so we've, we've uh, looked for the post-compromise techniques that the adversaries use, and we've created something called ATT&CK, um, which is uh, called Adversary Tactics and Techniques in Common Knowledge. Um, and what we've done with that knowledge is we've fed it into enterprise defense by understanding what data sources we needed to create analytics and then prioritize based on, on uh, what our threats and, and risk exposure is. So like I said, we, we broke down the cyber kill chain, the last three elements, into 10 tactics, uh, as you can see there. Um, so we found that just looking at the cyber kill chain, it's not granular enough to be able to point to a single element on it and give a good description of what happened. Um, and and also that there's really not a common language that's used by the report writers and the, the, uh, the forensics groups that do go in there and do the postmortems after a compromise. So we focus on not describing using the tools that the adversary uses, but the behaviors and the actual techniques that are used. And we've worked with world-class red teamers and blue teamers to expand this, this knowledge base. So back in 2014, this is what it started out looking like. It expanded to this in 2015, and now it's this monster right here. Um, so as you can see, we've got the 10 tactic, tactics across the top, and we have 120 plus techniques that we've described. So the, the model consists of the uh, tactic phases as they're, they're derived from the kill chain, or the, the life cycle. I have to remember not to say that. We're not paying Lockheed any money for that. Uh, so uh, we try to break it down uh, into better detail. And like I said, um, without the use of focusing specifically on the, tech, on the, uh, the software, but it, it is a component of it. Uh, the one big thing is, like I had talked about just before, the disambiguation of names of adversaries. So you have one, one um, reporting uh, company or, or research group that calls an adversary one name, and then you have another, ad another group calls it another name, but they're actually the same people. So what we've done is we've grouped all those together in, in a media wiki type format so that you can search and pivot and associate one with another. So here's an example of one of the techniques for creating a new service. Um, every single attack technique has a description, the platform, the permissions, uh, detection strategies, mitigation strategies, all of the sources that we use uh, that you can use to detect it. 
and it, the, that's where the examples are here, the software and the groups that have been known to use it. And we also link to KPEC, which is, uh, it provides even more detail about that specific technique. Uh, it's an external source as well. So here's an example of what a group page would look like. Again, we give a description, and then the aliases are where it all comes in, uh, where all the, the associations come in. And then we can, because it is, like I said, MediaWiki, we can pivot amongst um, the different techniques, and they all link to one another. And then here's an example of software. As you can see, it's, there's some good information. And like I said, every single element within the attack framework has descriptions like this. So some of the use cases for this that we've used and we've, we've worked with our sponsors on using it for is identifying gaps in your current defenses, both from a sensor capability and from a, an analytic writing, writing capability. Uh, you can prioritize your detection once you get a profile of, of what your, your uh, posture looks like. It's also good for threat sharing and information sharing. So if you observe something that's happening on your network, you can highlight the, the techniques that are being employed on your network if you're able to detect them and share them with your analysts, share them with your uh, industry groups, share them with the other, uh, the other socks that you might be working with. It's also great for simulations and exercise. That's actually how this got its start. Our, uh, our white team or purple team lead came up with this uh, this model so that we could test our analytics and our sensing capabilities uh, in a more scientific way so that we weren't just selecting things at random or being incomplete with our testing. And I'll get to the, uh, the red team, blue team events that we did in a little bit. It's also good for research about uh, looking into more details about what an adversary is employing and, and even thinking about new and interesting ways that that adversaries can behave that aren't on this, this spreadsheet. We are taking submissions for this. So here's a, what your matrix might look like after you've done some analysis on your network, worked with your vendors to see what your security posture looks like, where red is that you have no confidence that you're able to detect anything, yellow means you have some level of confidence you can detect some actions, and then green means that you're pretty confident that you're gonna be able to see what an adversary is doing. Now, this one looks pretty crappy. This is if you just have perimeter defenses, like you've got your internet connection going out to the world, you've got a tap on it, you're getting PCAP, you're doing IDS alerts, you're doing rip and inspect SSL. You know, you can have the most robust perimeter security, but if that's all you're doing, this is what you're, what you're able to, do, to detect. Because you don't have that level of granularity. You can't see the lateral, well, you can't see any network connections inside your network, so you're not seeing any lateral movement, you're not seeing any commands that are running on the endpoints, like uh, um, you know, the tools being launched, you're not seeing uh, credential dumping, et cetera. So that's why uh, we're looking at mostly host-based sensing. So here's numerically the breakdown of the techniques that we're looking at. And here's the number of techniques that we found in our research and our, our work with, with other groups. So a lot of them are in use, but there are also some that we've found through understanding Windows internals, or um, we're also overlaying it over the attack framework here. And the ones that aren't highlighted, those are ones that are they're definitely possible for adversaries to use, but they just haven't been reported publicly. Whether that's because the in the breach reports, they don't have the, the tools available to confirm that the adversary did that, or there's some secret sauce on their networks and enterprises that they can't divulge that the adversary was able to do that because it's such a critical part that they can't make any changes to it. So they didn't want to tell anyone. So this website is available on the web. It is attack.miner.org. It's uh, available free to use for you to share and uh, contribute to. We appreciate all contributions to it. So now that we have modeled the adversary and what they can do, we have to find them. So once they're on your network, they wanna blend in. They don't wanna stand out like a sore thumb, and even when they're doing what they're doing, uh, whether it's an exfiltration campaign to steal intellectual property, um, I mean, that's, that's one of the big things that we're concerned about in, in our industry. Uh, they're gonna be opening documents on the computer, they're gonna be reading emails, they're gonna be doing the same stuff that a normal user would be doing when they're collecting the intelligence or, or even doing, uh, you know, the looking at network shares if you have them mounted, they're just gonna be looking like users. 
So a lot of the tools that are currently employed on the networks and on the endpoints don't really look for these behaviors. They're more focused on signatures uh, with antivirus solutions, or if you have network-based solutions, they're looking at a lot of bad IP addresses or, or known bad, um, very, in, very fragile indicators. That if an adversary re recompiles their malware, or they go to a different IP address, or just park on a different domain name, they're going to avoid a lot of your, your work. So we've focused on the known behaviors, uh, and we use that threat-based model of the attack framework to inform our, our, our techniques and methods of developing the analytics. And we work in an iterative fashion so that we do a rinse and repeat after we test all of our analytics in, in a production environment. And that way we can further improve the analytics and work, make them work better and filter out a lot of that noise. And like I said, we do develop these analytics in a realistic environment. It's on our production network um, where we have real users doing real things. Now there are about 250 computers in this, this little subsection of our network, but it is our live network. Uh, we have users that have uh, permission to run MySQL databases on their, their computers or uh, have, they're running uh, VMware or VirtualBox on there. So there, there are lots of weird things that, uh, that are visible on our network or that are happening on the endpoints. So it gives us a lot more to work with even though it's a smaller network. They are primarily running Windows 7 but we are migrating to Windows 10 and that is presenting some challenges but also some advantages with some of the new monitoring capabilities just built into Windows 10. So here's our iterative life cycle. We start off by asking the questions about what we want to detect, and we create the analytics after we find out the data source we need, we test, we have a discussion afterwards, and then we cycle through. So the first step is what do we want to detect? What are the behaviors that we want to uh, improve our, our security posture on from the attack framework? And we want to turn those red boxes to green if possible. So now we identify the tools that we want to use. And like I said before, we're looking at host-based tools. Uh, you have a lot more opportunities to detect the adversary when you're on the host. When you're looking at the network connections that are originating from the host and are able to associate that with processes that are launching, especially if you can get the full command line of those processes. And there was a, a great talk by Bechtel uh, two days ago when they were really focusing on PowerShell I believe there's another one right after this over in one of the southern rooms too where they're continuing that, that train of thought. I highly encourage you to take it, to, to attend that one, and also the Splunking the Endpoint uh, talk later this afternoon. Um, so when you're on the endpoint, if I can get back to this, um, there was a Verizon uh, DBIR report that said, that was in 2013, that 85% of, the, intellectual, of the, the victims of intellectual property theft didn't have a clear picture of what was actually taken. So when you do have that visibility on the endpoint, you're able to watch specific locations on your drives or on your local drives or on your network shares if you're monitoring those to see what's being read by whom when. If you have really good property control, and if there is a breach, then you can identify what's been stolen and then remediate, take, take action to, um, to either notify people whose PII has been compromised or to, uh, take other, other mitigation strategies into play. Some of the sensor options that we've identified, uh, a lot of these are downstairs, uh, I believe. Actually, I think three of the four are. Um, and they're fantastic tools. There are plenty more that are coming onto the market now that are able to provide the level of information that are, that's necessary to really create great analytics. But there's also really great stuff built into Windows. If you configure your Windows event logging correctly, you can get a lot of information, including that full command line. You can get some network traffic. You can get all sorts of stuff. But sysinternal sysmon is a great way to just start experimenting. Uh, it's, it takes a little bit of work to come up with the, the rules to, to have it configured so it's not blowing up your Splunk license. But once you get that figured out and tailored to your needs, uh, it's, it's a fantastic tool. There is a configuration that James Brodsky from Splunk did put out there. If you attend the the power or the uh, Splunking the Endpoint class, he'll give you the links there and walk you through um, finding ransomware using uh, Sysmon as one of the tools. Another great tool that we've used is the, the auto runs tool. I can actually just jump ahead. 
So we've used the sysinternals auto runs tool. We run that in periodic, um, periodically to find out what is starting on boot. So in addition to monitoring things as they're happening on it, we also run periodic, periodic scans so that if we miss something, if there is, uh, our sensors go down, the capabilities are degraded because of an adversary, we still run scans so that we can identify anything that we might have missed. But scans alone don't give you what you need because there's always that time between scans that an adversary could do something and then reset everything back to the way it was before they got there. So don't rely on scans alone. So like I said, we're using Sysmon. We also wrote a custom event tracing for Windows sensor so that we can get some, some better detail on file monitoring. If you're more advanced and in, in, uh, you have good programmers, they can take advantage of those, those uh, um, subscriptions into uh, event tracing for Windows. And then we've, we've also installed the Splunk Universal Forwarder everywhere to get those Windows logs and run those scans periodically and bring that data back into our Splunk cluster. And the registry monitoring capability as well has been highly valuable for monitoring those auto runs locations so as changes are made, we're alerted. And there's also a way to use, well, it's not really DLP, but it's able to detect when their USB device is plugged in by watching those registry locations uh, for when a uh, USB device is inserted and, and uh, added to the registry. We, we do also do uh, some Splunk app for stream and that provides a lot of good information as well, associating processes with network activity. It's very configurable. If you haven't used it before, it's, it's definitely worth checking out. And we do have network sensing with PCAP on every switch. We're getting a, a ton of PCAP, NetFlows, and Suricata IDS alerts. So one of the most valuable things that we've identified when looking at the host is getting that story from when processes are launching, looking at the parent-child relationship of the processes. And with those commercial tools that I, that I showed you before, they tell you that story. So if you're living in a vacuum and you're only looking at one process launch at a time, you're not gonna get the full story. So command.exe in and of itself is not bad. If you wanna check your IP address on a Windows machine, you launch uh, command and you type IP config and see your IP address. That's not bad. Um, and that story would be told by Explorer launching command.exe. But if you have the process chain of Outlook launching your Acrobat reader, and then you see command.exe as a child of um, Acro read 32, that's bad. Uh, and you should probably take some action on that. Same thing goes for service host launching the WMI provider service and then command.exe. Again, that is an indicator of bad. So it's all about the story that you see from your processes that you can build by linking those parent and child process IDs. Another very important thing, especially when looking for lateral movement, is understanding what's happening with your hosts on the network. So we look for a host-based tool that can provide the normal metadata on network connections with source and destination IP and ports, protocol information, and even the message contents of uh, SMB2 messages, which uh, Stream does provide, and uh, also uh, a custom tool that we wrote that actually uses um, some capabilities of Wireshark. Um, but when you have the ability to see what processes are connecting to the network, you can then pivot between better host-based sensing uh, tools that give you the, the hashes of those processes that are launching and, and any other forensic or um, host process-based security tools that you're using. And then also to your network side. So if you have several layers of NAT in your enterprise, you can then use that IP and port information to trace it as it goes through in and out of your network. So now that we've identified the data sources, we need to start writing the analytics. And we've identified several different types of analytics. Uh, this is just a subset of those. And I'm actually gonna speed up through this so that we can uh, get to an example at the end of developing an analytic. Uh, all this will be available to you to download. Um, so here's, here's an example of techniques right out of the attack framework. Um, one of the, these examples here is a service launching command.exe, which would likely give system level access to whoever is running that. And that is a, a Splunk query that you can take home and, and apply it to fit in your network given your, your field names that you have. 
Uh, there are also situational awareness tech, uh, analytics. Now these are a little bit noisier, but they work great if you're using it as a base search in a dashboard. So you can take this base search and then you only have to run it once and then you can do lots of other things with it. So you can look at the running processes and you can sort it by, by host name or uh, sort it by process name. Um, or you can look for all user logons. And these can also become very useful later, especially if you're summarizing them, to find bad things after they happen uh, in a forensic fashion. There are also statistical or anomalous queries that we run. So we're looking for new executables that launch or uh, outlier parents of command.exe. So we would see that uh, the Acrobat reader would be an outlier process of command.exe because that normally wouldn't run. Also another outlier event that shouldn't really happen is clearing of the system event logs or the security event logs. Um, it may happen, people probably shouldn't be doing it, may not indicate something is actually bad, but it's good to know about it so that you can follow through with your, uh, your policies and procedures on that one. And now we have the forensic an analytics. So once you know something bad has happened, you can take a lot of the situational awareness analytics and tailor them down to focus on a specific host, specific user, or specific um, area of your network to look for more information. So if there is a credential dumping that you observe on your network or on, on a specific endpoint, you can go back to the situational awareness analytics, tailor it down to that specific machine, and find out which users had logged on since that computer last restarted to know the scope of your compromise, of which credentials were, were stolen so that you can then continue to look for when those users logged into different assets after that compromise. Okay. So what we've done is we've collected those analytics that we've been able to get through our public release process and we've posted them on the web. Uh, every single analytic that we have has a description, categorical information, the association with the attack framework. We've done pseudocode with it so you can apply it to whichever security tool you're using. And we also have unit tests for some of them as well to show how you can test the, the F, uh, efficiency and effectiveness of those those analytics. Uh, so that's available um, at car.miter.org. Um, we are taking lots of submissions and uh, we're happy to, to share that with you as well. So implementing those analytics. As you saw before with the, the Splunk query that we had, it, we had event types, we had uh, field names that you probably haven't seen before, uh, even within the, the common information model. What we've done is we've, we've created our own data model for identifying actions on the host. We found that the, um, the data models for IDS and for malware just didn't go far enough, um, and so we, had to, we rolled our own. Uh, and we did this out of necessity after we transitioned from one security tool to Sysmon. Um, we transitioned because we, our licensing was ready to expire and we wanted to move to a free solution. So we knew that we were gonna have to rewrite all of our analytics and we figured we might as well just only have to rewrite them once. So we created a data model, we just started aliasing fields, and now using, this, using the same queries, we can look at our old data and compare it to our new data, just by using field aliases. We also created event types and, um, and tags in order to more easily identify the actions that we're looking for. So we have process start event types, we have file access event types, et cetera. Here's an example of a segment of our props.com file. If you haven't done any uh, field aliasings or, e or calculated fields, this is essentially what it would look like. And then also the event types um, with doing the, the searches in that to create the event types. And here's an example of search path interception. This is one of the, the fairly, um, fairly easy to, to spot things that when the, you see this on your network, this is probably bad. So this is if somebody creates a file called C program, that any time there's a process that starts where the full path isn't quoted, that space between program and files, Windows just stops a program and launches that program. Now when the computer restarts, you might have seen a window that pops up on boot that says there's a program, there's a file called C program, do you want me to rename it? That's also an indicator that something bad might have happened. So now that we've written those analytics, it's time to test them. We, do a, we bring in a, a red team that has uh, lots of experience. They're OS, 
you have a question? I'm not sure. Do you know? The question was uh, whether or not uh, Windows generates an, uh, an entry in the event log if there is that detection of uh, C program. Did you have a question, sir? Okay, so the, the statement was that when there are scans in a PCI type environment or? Right. Right, so the, the scans do detect it, but if they are able to operate between scans and reset things to how they were, then you're blind to it. So that's why the, the real time detection is, is very necessary. Uh, so we do run cyber games with, a, a, I would consider them world class, uh, a excellent red team. And they're all OSCP certified and uh, they have years of experience both in our government sponsor spaces and with MITRE internally doing red teaming. Uh, they emulate an adversary. So we take the attack framework and we come up with a playbook. The, the white team lead or purple team lead comes up with a playbook of what, the of what the simulated adversary would do, and then it's up to the blue team to find them. We run them asynchronously so that the red team can finish their campaign, and then we tell the blue team, something bad happened within the last month, go find them. Uh, they're designed to push the analytic boundaries, to test our analytics, to push them to that next level to challenge our analysts to develop even better analytics, filter out that noise, and so on. So after that event happens, then we sit down and we have a hot wash and find out what did the red team, or what did the blue team miss that the red team did. Um, and focusing on credential theft, uh, we've gotten a little bit better. Uh, so this, we've run 13 cyber games from 2013 to 2015, um, and we've, we've done more since then, but this was um, using internal MITRE red teams. We've since started working with our government sponsors for them to, to also participate in these events. Um, but we've, uh, the, the green means that we detected the, the hosts and the credentials that were detect, that were stolen. Uh, the red means that we didn't detect it. And the yellow means that we didn't detect it, but it was just a failed log on. Uh, so as we progress throughout the years, we've, our detection rate has improved because our analytics have improved. Because if we don't detect something in that, that first red team, event, they try it again to see if we've improved. All right. So let's run through an example of, of how you would create an analytic. Okay, so you, let's say that we're looking for uh, suspicious commands because we don't have uh, any sort of detection on, on commands that we know to be bad. So we, we see that uh, in the attack coverage, it does cover several different tactics throughout the, the chain or throughout the, the attack framework. Uh, so it, it has a very high return on writing that, that analytic. So we, we're choosing to use Sysmon because it's installed in our, our environment and it provides that command line level view into what processes are, are starting. So here's some obfuscated Sysmon. And so one of the examples that we're looking for is net.exe. You can see it highlighted here. This is a, a Splunk query that if you uh, have your event type set to process starter, replace that with whatever you're using, you should be able to uh, detect here. Now, if you're not creating a calculated field for exe, you can always do star uh, backslashes and then that on your, uh, your uh, uh, I guess that would be not your command line, but your image path uh, field. So after the analytic is created and tested by the analyst with various commands, and we run through the red team exercise, and the blue team was alerted that the adversary created a new service with sc.exe, they started the service with net start, and then they dumped credentials using mimikatz.exe. But after the event happened, there's a hot wash, and the blue team missed certain things, so they improve and they expand their query to make it better for the next time. So the things that we learned is that our 
experiments validated that endpoint sensing is is great. I mean, we can we can find lots of adversary activity, and as we work together and share information, share analytics, uh, share configurations um, with with our sponsors and with industry, where we can continue to improve. Uh, so that's why we created the attack framework and published it, and the cyber analytic repository and published it, so that we can help everyone improve their security posture throughout the the uh, the cyber world, if you will. Um, we've also understood that the parent-child relationships is highly valuable for that process chaining to, to be able to tell the story, and we continue to improve those analytics. Um, so one of the things I did want to show you, since we still have some time left, uh, if I can get to it. So we have the attack framework here, and we have all these these tactics and techniques, and we have this uh, cyber analytic repository with all these analytics that are mapped to specific attack techniques over here. But how do you, I mean, what, what value is this out of the box? I mean, it takes a lot of work to take a red pencil or green pencil and shade everything in. So what we've done is we've created this tool, it's called the car exploration tool, and we've made this available as well. It's, car.mitre.org slash carrot. And if, you're, if you've implemented any of the analytics in your environment that are on car, you can select them and you can overlay them over the attack framework to see what your posture would be in the, in the network on your, your endpoints. So in this view, you can also select specific adversaries that you might have experienced uh, incidents from in the past where you're curious about it because you've heard in the news that this group has been you know, attacking an industry like yours, and you're at risk because of the work that you do, you can overlay the techniques that have been observed by that adversary onto the attack framework as well, and overlay it over your, your security posture. So this is a tool that we've made available that, um, that we hope people can get some value out of as well. Um, so that's, that's what I got. Are there any questions? This is car.mitre.org slash carrot, C-A-R-E-T. So, Mike, I have a question. Yes. Um, the data in car, is that uh, live updated based on stuff that you're pulling out of your threat intelligence and keeping it updated for those groups, or is that a periodic update? Based it on is. Checks? It's periodically updated. Okay. Um, so it's not updated every time we write a new analytic. Uh, so as we get more submissions... Um, they do get added, and uh, and so it will get updated periodically. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Okay. Oh, you got a question? Yeah. Do you have any examples of uh, ETW samples that you might have created for this purpose? Event tracing for Windows samples? Yeah. Uh, not in this slide deck. Um, but um, we, we have created a tool that does hook on to the, some of the, the providers. Um, I don't think I have it in the backup slides either. Um, but come, we can talk afterwards maybe. Yes. So uh, the question is about remote logins and how to detect remote logins versus on keyboard logins. So every time a user logs in and there is, there's an entry made into the Windows event log and it does say the, the type of logon. So it'd be a uh, interactive logon or remote interactive. Um, so you would be able to get all those from Windows event logs. Now you would have to compile the whole list and it, it's a little bit of an expensive process to do that, um, but if you are using report summarization, it, it could help speed that up when you're doing it after the fact. Um, you could also do a periodic scan. There are also tools that provide some of that information to you. I know that the uh, McAfee EPO agent provides a list of the users that have logged in since the last reboot. It doesn't give you the, the type of logon, um, but that can help you if you are collecting those security logs. Uh, and you have that list of users that was logged in, you can more easily reference the type of logon from Windows event logs from that. 
Yeah, so the forensic analytics are very similar to the, uh, the situational awareness analytics, but they're more tailored based on a specific host or a specific user. So it's for the, the after the fact deep dive into information. Yeah, so I guess there's a terminology collision there. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you very much.